Uh, that's where I uh, graduated from, and I was born and raised in Tucson, uh, but then I currently reside in Chandler, which is a suburb of Phoenix, uh, and I am not used to clouds or rain. Uh, so this, this is very uh, unique for me. Uh, I think I left, uh, you know, uh, clear blue skies and an a average of about 80 um, degrees. But it, it's nice to, to feel a change, and, and it's nice to see what precipitation from the sky feels like um, <laughs> once in a while. So I'm certainly happy to be here. Uh, so <clears throat> we'll go ahead and get started. The, the tricks that CF play um, starts early on. I mean, it starts uh, literally the, the day that we're diagnosed. And the first trick, and, and sometimes it, it can be one of the most dangerous ones. Um, when, we're, when we're born, uh, and, and now I, I speak uh, from the perspective as a parent, uh, when our children are born, we already write their story in our head. Um, we, already, we, we already have all the great things they're going to do, the great things they're going to accomplish, um, the great memories that we're going to form. And sometimes a diagnosis of X, Y, and Z, in this case, cystic fibrosis, uh, can change that tape, can change that story that we've written in our minds. Hopefully what you get from this is that doesn't need to be the case and it shouldn't be the case. But certainly for my own story, that was the first trick that was played on my mom. Uh, and that was in 1980. Um, I was born. Um, I, I seemed to be a quote-unquote, and I, I use this term very loosely, a quote-unquote normal baby. Uh, in my experience, I don't think I've met a normal one. Um, <laughs> But, you know, there wasn't anything that seemed to be wrong. Uh, I was born um, on a military base. My, my dad is a uh, lifelong Air Force man. Um, he, was, he was gone most of my early life with deployments and, and such, and then my parents divorced at a very, uh, when I was very young. So again, uh, my mom has always been kind of the active uh, presence in my life as a caretaker and uh, as, a, as a parent, as a coach, etc. But when I was born, like I said, everything was normal. Um, nothing seemed to be the matter. As I progressed through my, at this point, very short life, around the age of four, five months, probably closer to four months, things started to take a turn. Um, I don't know how they identified this, but I was, I, I've been told that I cried more than babies should cry. Um, I whined more, I fidgeted more, I, I, I looked uncomfortable uh, every day, and, and they weren't sure why. Uh, so my mom took me to the military doctors, no knock against our great military, but that was mistake number one. Um, and the military doctor said, it, it must be your breast milk. Um, we've seen this before, doesn't agree with your son, so that needs to be the, fir you know, the first thing we do, and we are confident that's going to solve all of, your, all of your issues. So I was put on formula. Um, fast forward to about six months of age, uh, I'm now hovering close to my birth weight. Uh, so that wasn't uh, the key. Uh, and I started to become more upset, started to cry more often, wasn't sleeping well. Uh, I just, they could look at me at this point and, and, and say, okay, something is wrong. Um, and, and we need to get a, a second opinion. <coughs> and so um, around the age of six months, they took me to the big hospital, uh, University Medical Center, and uh, they ran a battery of tests. And at this point in 1980, uh, doing a, a screening, uh, at the, if it was just for you know, a sweat chloride screening, um, was kind of an afterthought. But they decided to test me for CF because it was painless. Make them sweat, test it, and let's just get it out of the way so we can move on. 
and it came back positive. Uh, they, for whatever reason, didn't really believe it. Um, I didn't present a lot of the known um, symptoms that they expected. Um, I wasn't born with the meconium. I, I, uh, I was having you know, failure to thrive, which they learn more and more now is a presentation. Um, but again, they, they, the, the story goes, they tested me multiple times and it came back positive each time. Uh, and so finally, around the age of six and a half, seven months, I was diagnosed with cystic fibrosis. And, and again, this is where the first trick happened. And immediately I went from something's not quite right, but he's a normal boy, to my sick son. And, and from that day forward, because my cells didn't operate quite like everybody else's, uh, I was labeled as and treated as the sick kid. Um, and, and that was the, like I said, kind of the first uh, thing, the first trick that my mom fell for. Because again, what had really changed from the minute, the minute I was born to now seven months of age? I mean, nothing changed but maybe some information. Um, that being the diagnosis and, and, and placing these two little letters, CF, um, into my story. Um, but for a parent, and again, I understand, um, but for my mom, it was life-changing. For me, it was life-changing. And no longer was I treated normally. I was treated as a sick kid. So what did that look like for me? I was put into a bubble, and I was encapsulated by Mama Bear. Um, if I went out in public, and that was a big if, uh, my mom would shield me from anybody. Uh, if she was holding me, and a nice, good-intentioned granny wanted to come pinch my cheeks, she literally turned away and said, do not touch him. Uh, she was so... Uh, just encapsulated by fear that I would become more sick, uh, that, that if I caught a cold or, or I got uh, some stomach bug going around, that that would just be it, uh, and that she would then have failed as a mom. So the first point is, you know, can people with CF be born sick? Is there evidence to support that, that some things can happen while we're forming in the womb because of cystic fibrosis? Yes, there is. But the impact, generally speaking, that that has on the rest of your life is minimal. And I think the point for me is if we treat our kids like they're born sick, and not that maybe they can become sick, we're really missing the mark. And, and I was treated as if I was just simply born sick and I was going to stay sick. And that no matter what my presentations were, no matter what my symptoms were, because my cells didn't operate the same way as everybody else's, because I had this diagnosis, I was the sick kid. And, and you, can, you can cite multiple studies that your mental approach to addressing a chronic illness is often the key. So if my mom's mental approach to addressing CF was to treat me as a sick kid, you can imagine the ramifications of that, which we'll get into. So I was put in this bubble. Um, I had no um, friends. I didn't do play dates. Uh, the only other kids that I knew existed in the outside world were my cousins. Uh, and that's because my mom could look at their medical history and make sure they weren't in the presence of any cold for the last you know, week. Um, she Cloroxed and bleached and wiped down the counters 412 times a day. Um, literally, I mean, she told me she cleaned from sunup to sundown. And, and that's what she thought her job was, uh, to kill every bacteria, uh, anything in the air, um, she, she simply thought she was doing what was best. Uh, now again, there's some 
interesting studies that have come out that talk about how bacteria and being exposed to all this illness as a youngster is beneficial. I won't get into that. You'll just have to trust me. Um, but, but the presence of different bacteria and illnesses that train our immune system how to fight when the stakes aren't as high um, is very beneficial. And, and I wish I would have been sick more often as a kid. Um, but again, I, and, and I, I want to make sure as I'm talking, you're not thinking, man, he must hate his mom. Um, <laughs> and she must have been such a terrible person. She, she's a saint. Um, and I think the point is, is she was well-intentioned. She was a great parent. Uh, and she was, as we can all understand as parents in the room, just trying to do her best. Uh, and she, she wasn't equipped with some of the information that hopefully I can share with you today. So I'm going through life. I'm, I'm in this bubble. Again, uh, my only friend was Garfield, my black lab. I taught him how to play tag. It was pretty cool. Um, I spent all my days uh, uh, inside. And then once in a while, I got to go in the backyard. Uh, uh, but like I said, I was just very uh, sheltered. And a lot of this continued uh, until a very poignant talk uh, with one of my physicians when I was around the age of five. Uh, because at this point, right, we're starting to think about preschool, uh, education, um, etc. And so at this clinic appointment, this doctor asked, uh, he said, so, you know, Chris, that's my mom's name. Chris, what are your plans? Uh, what, what are you going to do with Ronnie? What, what preschools are you looking at? And uh, her response was, are you kidding me? I, I, I'm not going to have him go to any public uh, school. I'm not going to expose him to all these snotty-nosed kids. Uh, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do. I've looked into homeschooling. Uh, I've looked into one-on-one -on -one type of stuff. Uh, but I can tell you that I'm not going to put him uh, in the same room with a bunch of kids that could be sick. Uh, and, and what came next was, was literally the sentence that changed my life, that changed my mom's life, my mom's perspective, and, and that if that day wouldn't have, cur uh, have occurred, I can promise you uh, that I would be dead. Uh, and that is because the, the doctor looked at her right in the eye and she said, listen, Chris, I, I know you're doing your best. I, I know you're doing what you feel is the right thing to do. But I'm telling you, if you keep Ronnie in this bubble, and if you keep doing what you're doing, not only will he be somewhat physically disabled his whole life, but he's going to become mentally disabled as well. Uh, and, you know, praise God, she heard it. And she heard it loud and clear. And, and I remember as a five-year-old my life changing. Uh, and I, I realized at that point that people actually play in their front yards. Uh, and it was from that point on that uh, my mom, you know, again, it, 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 she had to humble herself, right? Uh, it, takes, it takes a hit to your pride because she thought she was doing the right thing. Um, uh, but she, she was willing to humble herself and, 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 and allow me to to get out, and she popped the bubble. And, and from that point forward, you know, if I wanted to eat cat poop out of the sandbox, <laughs> that's what I did. And if, if I wanted to suck down exhaust fumes from our minivan, that's what I did. And, and she made it very clear that from this point forward, um, I'm, I'm parenting my son. I'm not gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm stopping, I'm not gonna parent CF. Uh, and now, as her son, I still had cystic fibrosis, and there were things I needed to do because of cystic fibrosis, certainly, uh, which we'll, we'll learn. She did a very good job of making sure of that. Um, but, but from about the age of six on, uh, her parenting style changed from parenting a disease to parenting a child. 
and, and it saved my life. Um, and so, so again, the first trick, and if you can hear anything, just because your child's diagnosed with CF doesn't make them sick. They may become sick. I can't promise you that they won't. Um, but it's ebbs and flows. I'm 34. Sometimes I'm sick. Sometimes I'm not, just like everybody else in this room. Uh, just because my cells don't operate exactly the way that I'd like them to doesn't make me a sick person. And it doesn't make your kids sick. But if you treat them like they're the sick one, uh, like the doctor told my mom, they're going to become mentally disabled. And I can tell you that uh, the friends I know in the community that are mentally disabled because of CF are, are uh, much less happy than the ones that just have some physical uh, limitations. So, like I said, I'm, I'm moving on. Um, now, the only problem with this bag is sometimes my props get lost, so bear with me. Um, but I, I'm moving on through life. I'll take some of these out. And as my mom shares with me, I felt the um, ramifications. I felt the uh, positive uh, benefits of uh, being let out of that bubble. Um, but as she shared, she still cried herself to sleep every night. Uh, she was still ensnared by fear. Uh, and she still thought that I was going to live uh, a limited life. Uh, that her, her, her thought went from, I have a sick kid who they're telling me isn't going to make it very long. Uh, so I'm going to make sure that he doesn't become more sick. To, you know what, I'm going to let him do whatever he wants to do because I know he's going to be limited, and in the short life he's going to have, I want him to have a lot of fun. Um, but she still thought that I was going to kind of be living the CF life with my arms cuffed behind my back, that, that CF was going to limit me, uh, that it wasn't going to allow me to accomplish, again, this story that she already created in her mind when she found out she was pregnant with me. Um, and she was convinced of that. And she was not only convinced of that uh, because of uh, maybe the one support group that she went to. Um, uh, certainly, again, you know, when she would Google it, oh, actually, no, Google wasn't around then. Uh, when she would go to the public library and look up CF, uh, <laughs> things didn't look that great. Uh, the literature didn't exactly paint a rosy picture. Uh, and at this point, prior to six, uh, and I'm, I'm not a big slide guy, but if I showed you a slide, you'd actually see my PFTs started to increase after the bubble got popped. Um, but uh, she, she just figured, you know, he, he's, he is going to be held back, um, but I'm not going to let him know that. He can figure that out on his own. Uh, and like I said, she would still cry herself to sleep every night thinking that her son uh, was in these, these cuffs. That ultimately, right, and, and I know parents in this room have experienced it, this guilt that I gave my child CF. Um, my, what's, what's interesting is my mom actually didn't feel it as much as my grandma, um, which, again, has its perks. I'm my grandma's favorite. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I think it's so important as parents, we, we get over uh, this, this uh, guilt of, I did this. Um, because as you'll see, it, it just, um, you also have a big hand in, in doing something great and doing something positive. And the first step that my mom did was pop that bubble. Uh, and uh, then she, she started to put her money where her mouth was, just in terms of uh, making the sacrifices, which we'll talk about and putting in the time, uh, and being educated. Um, and, and for her, again, back in the, these days, you, you know, I think it's important to point out, in 1980, the, the number um, that the doctor talked about, the median, you know, half, uh, half of the communities over that age, half the communities under, 
Well, that age when I was diagnosed, depending on which source you looked at, was you know between 15 and 17. Uh, so certainly the picture wasn't as rosy. Uh, the only CF-specific treatment that we had uh, was really nothing. Uh, we took enzymes. Other people took enzymes, right? Um, I had albuterol. Asthmatics have albuterol. Uh, I had chest CPT, mostly for CF, but there are some other uh, people that use that. But as, but as far as people investigating a drug just for the CF community, there was none. Uh, we were treated mostly like asthmatics uh, or treated like people with, with COPD or you know, other lung uh, ailments or conditions. And so it was a, it was a much different time. Uh, it was a much uh, different, really, disease. Um, not to get off on too much of a tangent, but I look at some parents now who have kids with, you know, born with CF, and it's like, holy cow, what a great time to be born with CF. Uh, how many advantages there are that you can, take, you can take advantage of that my mom didn't have a choice. They weren't out there. But anyways, I, I digress, and we'll get to some of that. Um, I allow myself to go off on tangents because I never want my talks to be the same. Uh, because I figure the more I talk, again, maybe I'll say something uh, that's interesting uh, or that, that, that impacts you. But anyway, so my, my mom's thinking, OK, he's going to be limited. Um, and, um, he's, he's obviously always going to have CF. And since he's always going to have CF, uh, CF's always going to have uh, this impact on his life. And, and it kind of goes back to, uh, and, and these, these tricks are very similar, because if you think your kid is sick, uh, naturally, you're going to think your kid is limited. Uh, how many people in this room have had a head cold? Are you a bit limited? Yes. Uh, any kind of sickness, that, that's kind of part of sickness. You feel limited. You can't do all of the things that you feel you've, you can do or that you usually do. Um, so again, put it in the bigger picture. If we, treat, if we treat our kids like they're sick, we're telling them that they're going to be limited their whole life. Uh, and in this day and age, we don't have a cure. And so we are, again, cementing that and saying simply, you're going to be born with CF. You're going to die with CF. You're going to be sick now. You're going to die sick. You're going to be limited now, and you're going to die limited. Nothing's going to change. We have to remember the way us as kids process how our parents treat us. And, and, and having a two and a half year old now myself, I can tell you, kids are really smart. Uh, it's amazing how smart they are. I wish they weren't, because I can't get away with all my shenanigans. Um, but as a kid, this is what I was hearing. Um, by the way my mom treated me, I just simply felt that I wasn't going to be around very long. Uh, the way the doctors spoke, uh, it was never, you know, if, 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 you know uh, in high school, this. It was literally, you know, if he's, if he's fortunate enough to make it to high school. Uh, and so I think we have to be careful about the words we choose. Uh, and that, of course, starts with how you feel about it, how you feel about this disease, uh, your mental state. And, and like I said, my mom's mental state was terrible to begin with. And, and at least what she did, what I commend her, Sure, she tried herself to sleep every night, but after she popped that bubble, I never saw that. Her attitude changed in front of me. And it was always talking about the future and all of the great things I was going to do and she was going to make sure of it uh, because we were going to start making really, you know, not start, we were going to continue making really good choices. Um, and that CF was just a little uh, blip, on the, blip on the map. Uh, and, and like I said, it, it's, it's amazing the mental approach, uh, the, the effect that a positive mental approach has on this disease. Uh, and I'm so thankful that my mom started to see as her attitude changed, you know, maybe I wouldn't be so, so limited. You know, we talk about school, the preschool. So I did, I was enrolled in preschool and I got kicked out four days later. Um, <laughs> So I wasn't that limited, you know. I was, uh, uh, I, I was a crazy kid. Um, but so, so again, that that's a, another trick that that CF can play. The, you know, the next one, and and, and you'll see a lot of these all kind of happen 
uh, right around that diagnosis. And <coughs> maybe the first uh, couple of years of life. Because, you know, it's interesting. I, I'm able to work with a lot of parents and speak with a lot of parents. And, and, and it's, uh, suffice to say, obviously, newly diagnosed parents have the most questions. They have the most concerns. Um, they're, they're the ones searching for the most answers. And what's really great and what I've seen is as they move through life, as their kids get older, um, the questions start becoming less and less because they see all of these great things their children are doing. And CF becomes, uh, plays much less of a role uh, in their child's life than they thought it would. Uh, and it's not on the forefront of their mind like they thought it would be because they start to see their children grow up. My mom started to see me grow up and be like, I mean, this kid is, if he's abnormal, he's abnormally active. Uh, he's abnormally mouthy. He has an abnormal lack of respect for elders. Uh, and, and she started to see me, again, as just this normal kid with normal kid problems. Um, and, and sure, we, we all recognize and recognized that I was different in some way, right? But again, the more people we meet, have we, have, please raise your hand if you've ever met somebody who's normal, right? <laughs> what is normal? Um, and I think what separates the, the greats from the, from the, the, the averages, uh, the regular Joes, is people are allowed to identify, are, are able to identify what makes them different uh, and really embrace it and use that to propel their life forward and not to hold them back. And so that's, you know, why I, I got this shirt and uh, the two reasons. When I started this talk, it was around uh, the beginning of March and I knew St. Patrick's Day was coming up, so the, the shirt selection was limited for what I was looking for. Um, but a four-leaf clover is very different. It's very rare. Uh, you don't just see them every day. Uh, in Arizona, I never see them. Um, but some people think they're lucky. Their, their difference, their rarity makes them valuable. And what I loved about what my mom did is she switched her mental approach to that. She was going to make sure that what we got from CF in our lives set me apart in a good way. Um, that it became valuable, that we could embrace it, and that she could teach me life lessons through something I was going to be facing every day. Uh, and, you know, the other, the other cool thing I think that my mom did is still at this point, because of how she interacted with me, and um, even though I was in a bubble, uh, again, I didn't really feel different at that time because that's all I knew. Um, I thought, again, all kids just had their cousins as friends and that was it. Um, at that time, I actually thought that uh, everybody took pills, but that my parents grew out of it. And so this kind of came full circle in first grade for me. And uh, it was, it was uh, near the first week of uh, school, uh, of course. In the first couple of days, I already identified my best friend, and, and we were buddies, and we, had, we, we played in the playground together. His name was Jay, by the way. Played in the playground together. Um, uh, you know, we talked about whatever was popular back in those days. Uh, and then, of course, we, we ate lunch together at the same table. And during that first week, um, uh, now this was before you could carry pills on your person at school without being arrested. Uh, and serving time, but uh, I had my pills in my pocket like I did every day, um, and I put them out on the table uh, because, again, it just simply wasn't a big deal. I, I took pills. Um, I uh, thought everybody took pills, uh, and I put them out on the table, and Jay said, hey, Ronnie, why are you taking those pills? Uh, to which I responded, why aren't you taking pills? Uh, and, and he said, I don't know, I don't have to take pills. You know, why do you have to take pills? To which I responded, because my mom told me to. <laughs> um, and so I